Okay, well, welcome everyone to this meeting of the virtual IMS user group, and thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm. So I'm Trevor Eddles, I'm CEO of iTechEd Limited. We're a mainframe consultancy analysis and technical authoring organization. And we're responsible for the content on the virtual IMS website and producing the newsletters. And just to uh, be clear, the website is now at itech-ed.com forward slash virtual IMS. So it's itechEd.com forward slash virtual IMS. And just a note, we also look after the virtual CICS user group. So that's the adverts done. Um, let's run through the agenda for this meeting. As usual, most of the meeting will be taken up with a presentation. And today our guest presenter is Radek Mervek. Uh, he's principal software engineer at Broadcom. And his talk is called Java and SQL in IMS for ZOS applications. Um, a copy of the slides from this presentation will be on their website later today. And uh, by the way, if you've missed any of our previous meetings, you can download copies of the presentations from our website, or you can listen again to the whole session. And there's a link on our resources page. So following Radek's presentation and any questions you have for him, we'll move on to the latest IMS news, latest IMS related articles. A feedback request is there to remind me to ask you for your feedback about this virtual meeting. Then I'll give you the dates and times for the next virtual meetings. So that's pretty much the plan for the meeting. I'm anticipating that it will last for around an hour. Anyway, as I just said, today's presentation is from Radek Mirvek. Um, Radek joined CA Technologies, uh, which you'll remember was acquired by Broadcom in 2018. Uh, anyway, he joined um, in 2012 as an associate software engineer, and he was assigned to the CA ACF2 security product. A year later, he was reassigned to CA Database Management Solutions for IMS for ZOS, of IMS Tools. And nowadays he still works in the CA IMS tools team as a principal software engineer. He's involved in new development and sustaining work across the whole CA IMS tools portfolio. So uh, Radek, I'd like to thank you very much for being with us today. And what I'm going to do now is pass control of the meeting over to you. So hang on a second while we do that. Should have a message on your screen. Yes. Okay. So, well, I pull my slides. Okay. So, thank you very much for first inviting me here. So, it's, I'm really proud to be there. So, it's my first time uh, when I am presenting here. Also, thank Trevor for really nice introduction. Uh, it was it was really great. So because I prepared my own introduction, but uh, you already told everything. So, but uh, I only want to add that uh, outside of mainframe, uh, I also have some experience from distributed work, because I also worked on some uh, other web applications and that kind of stuff, and I have also some Java experience. Uh, .NET experience, and that's also why I am presenting about Java. So, but but the, my main work is for mainframe, and my mainframe experience is equal eight years right now. Uh, I know it's not so much, sure, and I believe that most of you have already more experience in mainframe than me. But still, I would like to try to share my experience, my skills uh, within you. Uh, well, so one more thing which I need to add, maybe you are hearing it already. I am not native English speaker. So I am from uh, Czech Republic and I am uh, 41 years old and uh, working for mainframe in Broadcom for eight years. 
Uh, now let's talk about uh, this, this presentations. Maybe the first question uh, which can come to your mind is uh, why is it version two? Okay, this presentation is quite old, let's say. Uh, it's already more than three years old. First time I presented this presentation two years ago at GSC Nordic. Then I followed in GSC UK and some other local smaller events. And this year I got some opportunity to present the same presentation here in virtual IMS group and also at share conference at Fort Worth. And before that, I tried to take a look at this. So to revive myself somehow what I presented three years ago. And I found that maybe it should be updated somehow. So at the end, I change 50% of presentation. So that's why I name it version two now. So because I removed some stuff from the presentation, I, I also included some stuff to presentations. So, and now it's a little bit different. So what's about? Uh, first, let's say what's not about, okay? So this presentation is not about GMP or GBP, okay? Forgot about that stuff. Uh, this presentation is a little bit different, let's say. So I am always trying, maybe uh, because I joined mainframe industry from distributed work, let's say, uh, in beginning, it was quite hard for me. So, and that's why I am still trying to find ways how to attract mainframe development for non-mainframe people. So our main goal for this presentation will be, or question, my question will be, is possible to write IMS application without knowing that I am writing IMS application? So it means that our goal is write to application, which will be same for MySQL, Oracle, DB2, or IMS. That's what we will try. And we will try to do that without any mainframe experience or skills. No assembler, no COBOL, nothing. Okay, let's start because there is a lot of things to cover. So there is some uh, legal stuff and there is my, my agenda. So I have a couple of chapters here, so seven. So we will go through all of them. So don't waste any time here and let's start. First, uh, first what we need to do is we need somehow to introduce our database, which we will be playing with. Uh, I don't expect that in real life, uh, anybody of you will use this scenario for new databases. But probably you can use it for all databases, for example, for testing purposes and so on. Uh, we will come back to this topic later. But first, we need to have some database which we will be wor working on. Okay, we have some DVD here, which is really simple one. Nothing surprising here. Just simple edge down, couple of segments, root segments, dependent segments, two, three levels. Really simple database as it can be. I believe that you already saw many times these DVDs or this kind of DVDs. So really nothing surprising. So we have this DVD for our database, which is something like, let's say, evidence of customers and orders, but really simplest one. Okay, we also need some PSB. Okay, here uh, I would like to spend a little bit time. Uh, first, what's important to mention here is take a look at the Prokop option. You can see AP. I believe you know why we have A, because we are interested in all operations. We would like to insert, update, delete, replace. We want to do all these operations with our data. But why we have P here? In first version of this presentation, I didn't have P here. But later on, 
when I edit some new stuff and I tried to do some, let's say, more advanced queries, I found that I am getting status code AM. So after some Googling, I found that's because I am trying to get more than one segment in one query, let's say, in one, one, in one request. And later I found that for that, I have to use that P option. So, and that's why we have a P here. If you will do some just simple queries like select asterisk from one table, you don't need it. But if you want to do some joins or some, let's say, joining tables queries, you need to do that uh, P here. Okay, so that's all PSB. The rest is again basic PSB as it can be. Okay, uh, DVD PSB is defined. And now we need to bring all database to live, let's say. So you already followed this process many of times. So just recap you need to generate DVD, generate ACVs, create data set, register to DBRC and bring your AMS system up and then create resources. And that's it. After following these steps, which you are doing on the basis, you have database ready, prepared, and our database is now prepared for our game. Okay, so database is ready. AMS system is hopefully up. So we can start to make some simple app. First, what we need to do first, uh, our database is empty, right? So we want to add some data. Okay, let's define our task now. Uh, we would like to insert one segment of each type. So how to do that? Usually we are doing this for this small database through DFS DLT, for example, why not? So you know that, so we have some inserts here, some data, and we are inserting some sample data to our segments, and that's it. DFS DLT, you all know. Uh, I also guess that almost everybody is using, or at least in past used. So that's how it can be done. So it's a simple task. Let's make it a little bit more difficult now. Let's add some logic. Okay, uh, I want to get uh, order segment where ID is equal one and print it. But if it's not presented in database, I would like to insert it. So now we have some logic here defined. How to do that with DFS DDLT? Oh, <laughs> probably not possible, but uh, we can pick another way. Okay, what about to try a ball? Yeah, it's possible. What I need to say here, I am not COBOL programmer. I started to learn COBOL when I work on the second version of presentation. And I started only because I wanted to write this small application which will be inserting and querying some, some data to my database. It was only the reason. So I put to slide only a screenshot of procedure division because I really don't want to waste time with printing all that uh, other divisions which are needed. But here in this example, I guess that many of you know Cobol. You can see that we are first trying to get unique for segment and if status code is GE, which means uh, not presented, then we are try trying to insert that segment and print record inserted. Otherwise, if this segment has been found, we are printing ID and order ID to the the output and that's it so really simple simple example uh, which uh, which is uh, 
the basic uh, basic one and it is a couple, couple which you already already know okay but now now uh, we have a problem so you are a couple programmer maybe you are only one couple programmer in your shop so and you got the request from your management that they want to create some reporting application which will pull your data from database once a week for example and present them in some graphical interface like some graphs or some tables and so on you are really busy as an only cobol programmer in your shop and management will give you let's say two days so is it possible probably for you not for you it's not possible because at least you don't have the time for this and frankly speaking so make this kind of application is cobol it's another question so but you have one opportunity there are plenty of new guys they just came from university so they know nothing about mainframe they know nothing about uh, ims but they are programmers they are working on some web applications so and they are just fresh graduates so question is can they help you somehow without need of training of mainframe training or ims training or assembler training training or cobol training just can they immediately start to write this kind of application that's all question what we will try to do now but first to be able to allow them to work on this kind of task we need to prepare them environment so let's take a look what will be needed so here we have a four guys which i am saying that they are minimum required steps and usually uh, when i am presenting in front of some audience uh, i am asking the question if it's true if all of them are really required the answer is no only three of them are really required but i put them four because with this one guy which i'm still hiding <laughs> it's really much more easier who is it yeah it is ims catalog why is it possible so it's easy so java access and sql access to ims databases was here before ims catalog has been introduced the problem is that if you would like to get your data from ims without ims catalog you will need to have also database metadata in your Java application, which means that you will need to download them from mainframe, create Java classes from this metadata, include them to your Java project, and build your application bundled with this metadata. With IMS catalog, you don't need care about it you just specify your psb and application will take care about the rest it will download all this data from ms catalog automatically without any any need of your involvement okay so now let's go through these four uh four items in a little bit more details but don't expect any huge details because time is limited but at least i would like to share some proc like configuration members examples for each of the of these items first one which i mentioned is ims cataloged and managed acbs managed acbs is not needed i only have it here because uh, I am using the example of ProClite member where we have uh, ACB, uh, ACB management enabled. And uh, my 
Uh, my suggestion is because I know that not everybody is using IMS catalog or managed ACDs. So uh, if you plan to start to play a little bit more with the Java stuff, so I really encourage you to start to using at least the IMS catalog because you will see that your life is much more, much more easier. That's about IMS catalog, which probably is only item which can be new for you because I guess that the rest three items are already in place on your shops. Uh, the next one is common service layer, which probably you are already using because you are already running multiple IMS systems in IMS plexus. You don't need multiple IMS systems for this task. You can have just IMS plex with uh, simple IMS systems. Why not? It's possible, but you need common service layer. And you need common service layer because you will be using IMS Connect and ODBM. And these three guys are really connected together. So that's for common service layer. There is an example of a configuration member, and there is one for initialization configuration member for common service layer. The next one, IMS Connect. IMS Connect is quite important in all tasks because we want to create application which will reside somewhere, nobody care where, and uh, it will try to access IMS as a black box or whole mainframe. And for that, we need some gateway. And IMS Connect will be that gateway. IMS Connect will get all our queries from our application because it is the CPIP server, as you know. And then it will pass this request to IMS and wait the response and response will be passed back to our uh, application. So for IMS Connect, uh, just uh, I would like to point out two, two things here which are important and which we need to remember, and it is DRGA port and the host name. Because we will need these, only these two things later when we will be creating our application. Only these two things we are interested in. And next one, Open Database Manager. Yeah, I heard a lot of, lot of rumors, complaints about Open Database Manager. So, and the truth is that not so many shops is using Open Database Manager. Uh, sometimes I ask why. So sometimes I heard that uh, customers are aware about security. Maybe that's the reason why I create another presentation about ODBM security. And uh, yeah, ODBM is needed for our task. What is it doing ODBM here? ODBM, let's say, will be something as a translator. ODBM will get the request from IMS Connect, then it will translate it to IMS language, let's say, and wait for response and pass it to IMS, of course, and wait for response. And after response, it will be translated back to IMS Connect. And IMS Connect, as I mentioned before, will pass that response back to our application. So let's say that Open Database Manager will be for us something like a bridge, something like bridge, which will be connecting IMS Connect with IMS Database System, okay? And that's uh, why it's needed uh, because it's translating that SQL, SQL queries and other, uh, other Open Database uh, uh, requests to IMS. Uh, there is there is another configuration member where you can specify data stores if you are planning to manage more than one IMS system in Open Database uh, Manager. It is all about our requirements. We can spend 
more than one hour just talking about these requirements. But it is really out of scope of these presentations. Please take these four configuration ProClive members as only uh, some kind of what needs to be done before I will. Okay, so just I need these four things to be running. So that's just only a reminder. Well, so if we are lucky, and we are because we are skilled main framers, right? So we are ready now. So everything is running, IMA system is up, all database is up, all these four guys are in place and they are working perfectly and waiting our request. So now, basically now we can pass all tasks to get new young guys. But before that, because I mentioned in the beginning, uh, let's, let's assume that they don't know anything about about IMS. So we will need somehow to translate our request to J language. And you can be sure that J language will be SQL. Why SQL? Because SQL is a common common language for manipulating with uh, data in a relational databases and also they met it uh, really on daily basis during their studies on high schools or universities. So that's why we need somehow to translate this request to SQL. How to do that? Uh, you will have just simple tasks here, not, nothing complicated. So let's define these three, uh, three keywords. Let's say DVD will be database. Okay, how surprising. Segment will be table and field will be column. There is much more of these mapping keywords, but for our task, these three are really enough. So now we have defined these three keywords and we are prepared to ask them for some work. And first, if you remember how we started, our task, first task was we would like to insert one record for each table. So we have a task. So what do you think uh, how they will proceed with this task? So you can be sure that they will proceed this way. This five inserts is doing exactly the same thing as we did through the FSDDLT. On the other hand, if you imagine, if you will show that new guy these five inserts and put beside that source of the FSDDLT, believe me, he will be really confused for this, that DFSD DLT, but he will be immediately fine with these SQL inserts. For people who don't know SQL, it can be confusing. And it is really great example. If you feel that these five inserts are somehow complicated for you, you don't understand them, you can be sure that, that young people who never met mainframe uh, or IMS will feel the same when you show them the DFSD DLT. It will be exactly the same feeling as you have if you don't understand these five inserts. So, and that's, so that's it. So if you give them this task, they will do it this way. Okay, now maybe for somebody set time, but now we will leave mainframe and uh, we will pass the work to outside of mainframe 
for that, or to be able to do that, we will need some tools. Uh, I picked these, these two, Visual Studio and Eclipse. The Visual Studio, the main reason why I pick it is because I'm personally using Visual Studio Code and also Visual Studio for bigger projects. And I'm also using Zovi. And that Eclipse, it's here because, uh, uh, because I want to show you as one Eclipse based tool, which uh, will be probably our first live demo, which we will try it, um, right, right now. So, okay. I try to switch, switch here. Okay. I hope you all are seeing my screen. Yeah, uh, this is this is workspace of uh, IMS Explorer for uh, development, which is Eclipse based tool provided by IBM. The important thing is that it's free, so everybody can use it so without any charge of IBM. And it is really a very, very helpful tool. And we will try some really, really simple, simple task. Uh, first, what we will need is that first we need to create database connection, which is which is really simple and it's about a couple, couple of clicks. And here, as I mentioned before, just a reminder, uh, we need to remember that host address and the RDA port number, which we will be filling in this form. And our host is on same like this. And port number. Our test lab is this one. The third parameter which is needed is your PSB name. Of course, you need it because you want to access your database. Now we can test the connection. Okay. Now, I have wrong host name. Yeah. Connection succeed. So now we can connect to our IMS database through defined or PSB. Now we are connected to our database. And now we can take a look how database look. So first, it's quite a good feature is that you can easily create graphic representation of your database and it's again just one click which is this one and here voila you see how your database is structured which is which is really nice feature and uh, it took uh, that dvd from online system which is already there and up. And let's let's imagine a situation that uh, you get some old old DVD which is uh, on ten pages of source, and you are trying to imagine how is it structured. So I believe it's almost impossible to get this view from from your mind only. So and here in this tool is just one click and it will print you this nice graphic representation of that, that the database, how it looks and uh, how is it uh, structured. Uh, we are using this, uh, for example, if we got some, uh, some DVDs from our customers and we want to see how these DVDs are, look like, so we are usually printing them and, and we are more familiar than uh, with that DVD or database uh, structure. 
other things what you can do here is that you can take a peek at your uh, segments or tables. So here we have a root, and uh, also there are some some fields or columns, let's say. If you are interested, if we have some data here, you can just easily go return all, and you see that there are no any data because we didn't run uh, any application so far, so the database is still uh, still empty. So uh, this uh, IMS Explorer is able to do a lot of a uh, lot of other other things. So you can you can create some database projects here. Uh, you can design your uh, DBDs and uh, PSBs in graphical graphical way. Uh, and at least it's quite a good introduction to IMS because, uh, for example, as in our case, so if we have uh, some guy who is able to work with relational databases, he will be familiar with these kind of views because it is same for other databases. But he can slowly be also through this tool involved in some relation to, to IMS. So I really encourage you to give it at least try. It's free and it's really helpful if you want to get some just just speaks to some of your data or some simple select queries or something like that. And since it's Eclipse based tool, so you can start writing your Java application immediately here. So so why not? So we will be using uh, Visual Studio Code for our task. But still, it can be done also here. Uh, that applications can be written in other IDs which you like. Why not? It can be also in Notepad. Why not? So it really depends on developer uh, who will pick their favorite uh, IDs. So, so that's that's about about that uh, uh, IMS Explorer, which is really helpful. I'm using it just only uh, picking to data and uh, taking a look how databases are designed. Uh, so now go back to presentation. So, well, now I hope you are seeing my, my presentation back. And let's continue. Yeah, that's what we saw in that IMS Explorer. Okay. And now, we can start to do some Java coding. Usually, again, I am asking audience how many of you is knowledgeable of Java. So usually, a couple of people are already familiar with Java programming language and also with SQL. So it will be easier for you. For you who don't have much experience in Java, maybe known. So I still will be showing just really very, very simple uh, applications and I believe you will be able to fully understand them. Okay, so before we start, we again, we will need also some, some requirements, let's say. For Java application, if you plan to access some relational databases, you need JDBC driver. JDBC driver is kind of library, which is providing some needed code for accessing database through SQL. Uh, since IMS release 15.1, IBM did really very clever solution or decision, and they uploaded their IMS JDBC driver to central Maven repository. I didn't know that. I found it by some Googling, but uh, the, the thing is that previously, when I presented first time, 
this presentation, I needed to go to IBM web page and search for JDB, uh, IMS JDBC driver, download it, then include it to my class path and compile it, my application with it and bundle this JDBC driver with my applications. Now, if you are using Maven, well, the question is if you know what Maven is, but let's Maven is, uh, let's assume it as a building, building tool. So Maven is taking care about all your application dependencies. It's take care about compiling, building, testing, publishing. Okay, so it's just, just tool. And this tool is configured uh, through uh, XML files and the dependency uh, is part of this configuration. And if you plan to use IMS uh, through IMS JDBC driver, the only thing which you need to do is add the dependency, these three lines to your Maven configuration. And the Maven during the compilation step will take care about downloading this JDBC driver from central Maven repository and include it to your project. You don't need care about MS JDBC driver. If you plan to use multiple databases, you can add more than this one. So you can also add DB2 JDBC driver, why not? And then you will just switch between them. But now what's important, it's only a requirement that if you plan to do Java application for IMS, you will need JDBC driver and JDBC driver can be including manually if you download it or through Maven dependency. <clears throat> now, if our JDBC driver is in place, we need to open connection. Uh, open connection uh, can be done through two interfaces. One is JDBC data source interface. Second one is JDBC driver manager interface. The question which one is better, let's say. Uh, let's say that JDBC data source interface at least is newer and it's supporting uh, many of new features. For example, data source interface is supporting connection pooling. Uh, it's also performing uh, better than driver manager, which is older. So my recommendation is use data source interface. There are many of reasons. And also in our following uh, examples, we will be also using the JDBC data source interface. But at least I would like to show you how to get connection through driver manager interface which is this uh, snippet of code, uh, which is really simple code. First, in that first try block, uh, we will load that IMS uh, driver class. Uh, then you will just set that JDBC string in that uh, URL. And here you can see these two values from our IMS connect configuration. We have a host name and DRDA port here. And the next one is our uh, PSB name. So, and that's it. So these three variables are only needed uh, values which you need to create a connection. When everything is set, then we call get connection method of driver manager object and we get connection and we are done. On other hand, how to do that with a uh, data source interface, I mean, it looks, it's a little bit more complicated, but believe me, it's not. It's also, also really simple. The difference here is uh, that uh, we are setting the properties of uh, IMS data source object directly. So it means that we are setting the same values. So we are setting my PSB, uh, we are setting host name, port name, driver type, and again, user ID password. And, and that's it. And then we call the method get connection of IMS uh, data source object, and we have a connection. And, and that's it. So really, again, uh, simple, uh, simple how to how to get connection from from our application. Now uh, there is a, some some uh, logic. 
So again, uh, just just a reminder uh, what we did in our second application, which was in COBOL. So and it was uh, our task was get get record where ID is equal one. If it's not presented, then insert this record to our database, and, and that's it. Here we have the same task, but now it's in Java. Let's go. Let's go through these couple of of lines of code. Uh, you can complain that the amount of lines is is the almost the same as it was in COBOL, but that's that's not our task. Our task is do the same work which we are doing in COBOL in uh, in Java without knowing about about IMS or mainframe. The the main goal is. Uh, that we are creating application and we don't care which database is behind. For example, if you do the same application for MySQL, for example, where will be the same database structure, the code will be look exactly same. There won't be any difference. So there is nowhere anything about IMS. Now nothing about other databases stuff. It's just application logic, nothing more. So, so let's go through quickly. So there is some prepared statement, uh, which is also supported uh, supported by IMS JDBC driver, which is really a great feature of JDBC, uh, and it's it's recommended way how to use SQL statements, and it's your protection against SQL injection. So we are using it here. We are using select asterisks from XXX order statement. Then we are executing query, checking if we have uh, any output in that rs.next. If there is any output, we are printing that output. And if not, so we are trying to insert uh, into our database uh, that, that record and that's it. So really, really simple, simple application, no, no magic here. And we can try to, to run it. Okay, uh, let's go back to Visual Studio Code. Sorry, back, he wasn't there. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's a different application. So, okay, here you can see my uh, my Java application here, and uh, there is a source code the same as we saw in that slide. So we are doing basically the same thing, uh, only for opening connection or getting connection, we are using data source factory class, uh, which is which is here, and basically it's doing what we saw also in slide. So the the point here is that uh, if you will provide just this IMS specific settings, that application programmer will just write this application, and here he will be using the standard Java SQL data source object. So there is nothing about IMS. So basically it means that if you decide to change your database for different one, you don't need to touch your application code here. You will just touch that data source factory class. So that, that, that's all. So how to, how to run it? So first we need to build it, which is through Maven. Uh, I can also show that from XML. As I mentioned, there is a, that XML configuration for Maven. And the only IMS specific settings is here in the dependency part. These three lines. The rest is the same for all the Java applications. So now we will create the, that application. And now during this time, Maven is downloading, downloading all the dependencies with the IMS JDBC driver and build everything together. Now, if we run it, 
Okay, now there is some some output, and since if we remember correctly, the database was empty. Now, so now the record has been inserted. So it means that it went through that else branch, and if we run it again, the same application. We will see that now the, it's printing that record, and now it went through if branch of the of the code. So, which means it went through this this one. So really, really simple, simple application, uh, which is written in Java. Okay, let's go back to our presentation. Well, I know our last, last section, which is the most difficult one. We have only a couple of minutes. Well, so Spring Boot Hibernate ORM. Uh, so usually if I ask audience uh, who know what ORM is, uh, the answer is that nobody. <laughs> Maybe you now it will be different. But first, <clears throat> let's give you some really quickest, quickest overview of ORM in the world, probably because we can spend a day talking about ORM because it's really huge. Uh, but ORM uh, means, stands for Object um, Relational Mapping, which basically means if you are planning to write application in object-oriented language, so, so you would like to use your data as objects as well. It, it makes sense. So, uh, without ORM, you will need to create your objects manually because you get some records from your database and then you will need to create your object and fill all the data to that object. ORM is doing this for you. So, which means that if you set ORM correctly, so it will provide you uh, database data as uh, objects. So, uh, in first presentation, uh, I was curious if it possible to do that also with the IMS. It was my question. And now, finally, I put some time to try. And here, I would like to share what I found. So, uh, we have another application, uh, which will be some simple, uh, simple web application, which will be uh, do done in uh, Spring Boot. Uh, it's because I don't want to talk much about Spring Boot, but I pick this because it's really uh, very simple to create some quick applications. It's re really fast uh, without any um, difficult setup. So that's why I, we will be also using the Spring Boot. Uh, here, uh, there is an example of configuration. There's one of configuration of Spring Boot, which is stored in application properties file. And on the first line, um, maybe you think that I have a typo here because there is a JDBC MySQL. And uh, it is the first, let's say, hack uh, which you need to do if you plan to use Spring Boot with uh, IMS. The problem is that Spring, as a framework, doesn't know anything about IMS, of course. And uh, for configuration of data source, that URL is required field. So that's why we need to fill there any valid DBC string, but it will be dummy. So it won't be used in our application. That's why we are using this one because this one is uh, valid. The rest, the driver class name and type, it's the same as we used in our previous application. And then we have some uh, some custom uh, custom uh, properties here with the prefix IMS data source, and it is IMS specific uh, settings. Here we are setting that host again, the RDA port and PSB name 
and that's it. Again, these three values, that's all what we will need. The last line here is uh, for a database for Java persistence. And uh, it is because of Hibernate, because Hibernate will be mapping that object to SQLs. And for that, it needs some dialect. Unfortunately, IMS dialect doesn't exist so far. So that's why I found this uh, DB2, which is the closest one, but still it has a um, couple of problems because not all the SQL keywords are supported in uh, IMS JDBC. Uh, all the joins are not supported in IMS JDBC driver, but still it's doable through this dialect and there are some, uh, uh, some way how to, uh, how to circum some circumstances. Okay, so that's configuration for our Spring Boot uh, application. And now uh, we need somehow use that custom IMS data so prefix it uh, properties. And that's done through this Java class Spring. Java class, which is extending uh, our Spring Boot configuration with this configuration where we are saying, we also want to include IMS data source prefixed properties to our configuration. And later on, our uh, IMS JDBC driver can pick them and create connection for us. Uh, now, we need to take a look uh, how our segment, I'm a segment, will look as an object, okay? So if you are familiar with Java objects, so you can see that uh, it's standard objects. So what's only different here is that we are using annotation and that annotation is used because of Hibernate. You can configure Hibernate in two ways. One way is that you can configure it through XML files or you can use annotation. I'm using annotations because for me it looks a little bit cleaner, let's say. And here you can see that in top of the object or definition uh, public class order, we are saying entity, which means that we plan to map this object to uh, true uh, Hibernate. Then we are setting the table name and we are setting the columns here, column name ID and or ID, which are two fields, which are in segment uh, XXX order. So it's a simple example how that object will look and this object will be mapped to, uh, will be mapped through the uh, Hibernate framework. And later on, you can use it uh, immediately without any SQLs. Of course, if you want to use also some relations, so you can. And there is an example when uh, we have relations between uh, xxx cast and xxx order. And we have a one to one relations. Uh, and you can see that third, third field in xxx cast when we have private order order of type uh, order. And it's mapped to column name xxx order ID which is basically foreign key, which is creating through, through the JDBC and is based on pointers. A reference column is ID, which is pointing to XXX order table. And on the right side of screen, you can see that uh, relation, uh, which is mapped to order. And here you can see again, third field, which is customer, customer and it's mapped back to, to order. So I know that uh, it, is, uh, it is quite, quite difficult to, to follow and understand. So I don't expect that you will be immediately familiar with this one. It took me days, but 
uh, but believe me that uh, if you will get somebody from universities, so he will be uh, immediately familiar with this kind of stuff. So uh, they will be more experienced than me in this kind of stuff. So uh, I just learned that not so so long time ago. So and it's it's not so difficult. But if you are not using it on a daily basis, it can be a little bit tricky to understand. But the, again, the goal is uh, that uh, this approach will be used by people who are doing this uh this thing on daily basis so and they are already familiar with uh, these kind of things and these kind of technologies and now if you want to uh, manipulate uh, with your data so you can do it through these uh these methods so you can see that we are not using an sqls here so we are just calling uh, calling a method which are already implemented and there is no SQL behind. That SQL is generated through framework and it's hidden from user. Of course, you can switch on or traces and see them later in log, but in the application code, there is no SQL trace, no SQL commands. So ORM is providing already own some kind of SQL which can be used here. Uh, I am not using here because I really wanted the simplest uh, possible example for for this. So okay, so I think that uh, better to go for last last demo because we are already uh, out of time. Oops. Yeah, it's here. So, okay, first, first, let's take a look at that Maven configuration, uh, which is again the same as we saw in pre previous application, only three, li three lines, which are I'm a specific, and the rest is Spring Boot things, uh, which are needed here. And then we have that application properties, which we also saw in, in the example. And uh, we have here that, that configuration class, which is here. Again, no code here, just only deriving from some uh, some parent classes. So 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 that's it. So uh, and then we have uh, the objects. Again, we saw the same in in presentation. And also we have a controller here, which is doing some logic. So here it's doing basically select asterisks. And here in create, it's doing some inserts here. Okay, uh, it's it's using that, uh, that order service. Uh, so I only want you to give you proof that there is no hidden code or SQLs. This is the order repository, which is parent, which is interface, which is implemented in order service. And there is only find all, which is using that repository find all, which is already, already here. So you, you can see that really there is no hidden SQLs. So this application is uh, SQL free. Okay, now let's start this application. Since it's Spring Boot, we can immediately run. Now this command will again boot our application, start web server, and also publish that application. It's not there is no, no it's, it's going. So, and now application is up and it has been started in in that in that time in eight uh, eight second uh, i only need uh, one one thing to do here which i 
second. Okay. <clears throat> now it's the application. So I will share my Google Chrome. I hope you can see my Chrome. Okay, and cooler. So first, there are two two options: show orders. Let's take a look. And there is nothing yeah, because uh, meanwhile I deleted. I deleted uh, that uh, content of the database. Uh, if we go back to that Visual Studio Code, here, here in the log you can see that Hibernate generated select statement. Here it's select ID order ID from and and that's it. So if we go back. And we can we can create some order. Okay, and now if we go back to the Visual Studio Code. So somewhere here is the insert statement which has been created. Okay. So and as a proof in our application, go to the Chrome here and we can show orders. Yeah, and it's it's there. Now it inserted two segments. So it inserted customer or XX cast segment, and it also inserted XX order segment. And both these segments are connected together. So, so that's it. So, okay, now let's go back to presentation for last time. Now, uh, the last last words. What I would like to say here is, I know uh, it was it was tough. Uh, it was very tough for people who doesn't have uh, any any knowledge or experience or skills with these kind of technologies. But what I wanted to show, uh, I really wanted to show you that uh, you can. You can get some new people, young people, graduates, fresh graduates, people from schools who doesn't know uh, anything about IMS or mainframe, and they can immediately start to write uh, IMS uh, applications without knowing that they are writing IMS or mainframe. IMS uh, applications, which which uh, basically means I, I am not saying to don't uh, teach them uh, any mainframe skills or IMS skills. Sure, teach them, but believe me that it's much better to show them that they can use this, let's say, old technology also in modern way. And that's my message. My message is that we need somehow attract new young people to show them that they can use our 50, more than 50 years old machines in the new technologies uh, which they are using already in their previous experience from distributed world, in their studies. And believe me, if, it's, if it was difficult for you to follow these ORM things and Java thing, believe me that it won't be difficult for them. 
For them, it will be difficult at mainframe, which is good for us, that assembler, cobalt stuff, it's, it's okay for us, but it will be for the first time really difficult for them, but they will be immediately able to create this kind of applications. The use cases. The use cases for this approach is, for example, you want to create some test uh, database and you want to pull huge amount of data to it. So you can do it this way because there exists plenty of open data projects where you can download huge amount of data and do whatever you want with them. So it's, it's one case. Other case is that you want to create some uh, application which will get your IMS data and create some nice reports. It will be around once a week and so on. Because the truth is, this approach cannot be used for some critical business application because the performance isn't the best one. But, but at least it can be used for testing for process, which is also very needed for, for us. So that's, that's my message. So, Adrian, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Sorry that we went 10 minutes more. So, but it was a lot of, lot of things to cover. And now I will pass back to Trevor. Okay, thank you very much. So, that was really interesting. Um, we've got time for a couple of quick questions. If ever anyone has any quick questions, if you want to type them in the box, we'll get uh, Radek to answer them while we're here. Otherwise, um, you can email me the questions or Radek, if you just give people your email address, if they've got a question, they can email you directly, perhaps. Yes, yeah, sure. I can provide email, but uh, I don't know in which way now. <laughs> Maybe you I can, can write it somewhere. Give me a second. Okay, I hope you see my notepad. No, yeah. Uh, yeah, just come up on the screen. Yep. Yeah. So there is my email address. So feel free to ask questions or whatever you want. All right. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, Karen Tish has just said, tough for me, but great message. Glad to see live examples. Thank you, Radek. So that's nice. Yeah. Hey, thank, thank you also. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, I have no questions for Radek, but I'd like to say thank you to him. That was from Thomas. And... Uh, Glad to see this working with Visual Studio now. That's from Key. So you're getting some nice messages, but no questions. So, um, yeah. So can I say thank you very much, Radek? Um, because we're a virtual user group, this is where we give you a virtual round of applause. Um, and uh, yeah, what I'll do is I'll take control back and just run through the last couple of slides. So thanks again, then, Radek. That, that was really interesting. You're welcome. Okay, let's, uh, uh, no news, so no, no one sent me any information about any, any uh, news, but articles have been a few. How does IMS 15.2's performance stack up against IMS 15.1's uh, by Richard Antical on the Z Systems developer community? We've got uh, IMS version 15.2 in your journey to the cloud by Skylar Loomis, again on Z Systems Developer Community. IMS 15 members online change enhancements. Option BLD PSB, no. And that's by Hiroaki Katahira on Z Systems Developer Community. And lastly, we've got the Modern IMS Ecosystem by Jim Porrell in Enterprise Executive Magazine. And if you go to our website, there are links to each of these so you can 
put them up. Uh, feedback requests, so there's my email on screen if you want to uh, email me with your comments about today's session or if you have a question for Radek, you can send it to me and I'll send it on to him. Looking to the future then, we're meeting on the 9th of June. The uh, presenter is Hayley Fung, who I think has presented before. She's talking about four paths to digital transformation. And then again on the 11th of August, when we've got Nick Griffin from BMC Software, and he's saying, reach the IMS database for eight gig line. Now what? So that'll be quite interesting then. And of course, can I remind you, you can keep up to date with what's going on in the virtual IMS user group and the world of IMS by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and we've got a LinkedIn group. And if you tweet or Instagram or anything nowadays, hashtag virtual IMS is the one to use. And of course, yeah, like us on Facebook. Everyone likes likes on social media. So uh, that's all for this meeting of the virtual IMS user group. Can I thank you all for attending? Uh, thanks to Rocket Software for sponsoring our user group. And I particularly want to thank Radek Mervek for today's presentation. So that's it. Um, thank you all for joining the meeting. And I look forward to seeing you next time on the 9th of June. So thank you and goodbye.